It's coming home, it's coming, football's coming home, it's coming home, it's coming, football's coming home. Three lines of the show. <laughs> I just thought we had to start with getting that out. And now it's out, it's gone, and it can wait until this evening. Is that not right? <laughs> that is right. So, you know, I don't support football at all. I really don't know anything about football. In fact, Festo wants to join the Monday night group, and I don't even know what he needs to be able to play football on a Monday night. So I need to ask someone to tell me what equipment I need to get for my husband so he can go and play football. Isn't that ridiculous? But I've watched the last two matches, and I'm watching tonight's. <laughs> Something, isn't it, about getting this far for England. But wouldn't it be amazing if today millions of people across this nation were gathering to worship God? And that's what we're going to do this morning. We're gathering to worship God. We're going to start in a moment. And um, we've got some smaller chairs at the front and a rug. I'd love the younger ones to come if they're... I know you don't want to sit at the front, do you? But um, I've got chocolate. Um, so you might want to sit at the front. And um, I'm going to have a boogie while we worship. So if you want to join me, feel free. Um, but let's worship God. Thanks, Niall. Well, good morning, everybody. Well, as Grace said, we're going to worship God. Now, we can't, we're not allowed to sing in the building. If you're at home, you can sing as much as you like. But in the building, you're just going to have to move to make up for it. I'm not going to tell you what to do, but, you know, you can, you can decide. Okay. Oh, sorry. Just, uh, just for, those, for the benefit of those at home as well, Steve has spilled his coffee <laughs> over, over here. <laughs> you, you can't see it, but... <laughs> We're going to sing Happy Day, and just, get just a real reminder of, of what Jesus has done for us. The greatest day, the greatest day in history. Death is beat and you have rescued me. Jesus is alive. The empty cross, the empty grave. Life eternal, you have won the day. Tell it all, Jesus is alive. place when I stand in that place free lives meeting face to face I am yours Jesus you are mine and this joy and this peace earthly pain finally will see celebrate Jesus is alive He's alive and oh, happy day, happy day, you wash my sin away.
one last time. Hello, happy day, happy day. You wash my sin away. Oh, happy day, happy day. I'll never be the same. Good morning, church. What a glorious day to be together, whether we're at home, um, online, or we're here in the building. And um, I'm just really excited about all that is going to happen today, all that is gonna, uh, God is going to do amongst us. And I hope we've come with a heart of expectation. So we've been singing Happy Day. Well, what do we want to thank God for? When we come together, it's really good to praise God, isn't it? It's really good to thank him for the good things that are going on. And it's really good to thank him for the good things going on in our family. Now, you may notice I'm holding something. Yeah, I think Eden likes these. Absolutely. So what you have to do to get one of these is have something that you want to say thank you to God for. So have a little think. If there's something you want to say thank you to God for, indicate towards me and I will come to you so you can say it and you can praise God and get a celebration. Anyone? Here we go. Thank you for daddy to, for daddy to come back from Tanzania. Wonderful. The same as William. <laughs> And Hannah said the same as well. We're just taking quickly. We're not taking it just to choose. Right, now my family's done. Oh, I've got a wobbly tooth. A wobbly tooth. That's brilliant. I love it. Anyone else? Anyone else? Do I have to say it to everyone? Um, thank you for chocolate. Okay. Amen, sister. Thank you for the semi-final and the final tonight. <laughs> Everyone roll their eyes. Anyone else <laughs> want to say thank you this morning? I had all my boys at home together for 24 hours, almost. Wow, thank you, Lord. That's wonderful. That's really wonderful, yes. I just want to thank God for bringing our son and his family back from Bali after being away for so many years and that we're all together and the cousins can be together um, and uh, it's such a blessing for us. So, yeah, thank you. Fantastic. Fan th fantastic praise to God for that. Brilliant. Absolutely. Yes. Our granddaughter, Juliet, is walking. Woo! That is really good news. Fantastic news. For anyone who doesn't know, that's a little bit delayed, more than a little bit delayed. A lot delayed. So that's fantastic news over here. Thank you, God, for making us to go to the cinema again. Yes. The first thing we saw was Peter Rabbit 2. It's got to be seen. Done, family. I tempt you. Uh, thank you, God, for Niall's sister who was visiting with us for a few days. Yay! Take three. That's because she's got three children. That's why I said that. <laughs> Wonderful. Isn't it great to thank God for the good things that he's doing amongst us? It's absolutely brilliant. Also, when we come together, it's really good for us just to take a moment of quiet and to uh, think about things that we might want to say sorry to God for. So I'm just going to encourage us to use our hands. So... Um, not all of us are very good at thinking inside our heads. That certainly works in my marriage. Festo is very good at thinking inside his head, and I'm very bad at thinking inside my head. So if you're bad at it, uh, what I recommend is you use your hand. So we're going to be saying sorry to God, and we're going to be thinking of something that we want to say sorry to God about. So you might want to put your hand in front of your mouth so that you can whisper it into your hand. Okay, it's only between you and God, nobody else is listening. And then after our time of quiet, I'm going to say a prayer for us. And what I want you to do is to 
close your fist like that, like you've caught it, yeah? Because we've just been singing about how great it is that God forgives us, and he does forgive us. In fact, we're already forgiven, but he still requires us to, for our own benefit to say when we've done stuff wrong. So grab it in your hand, and then when I say amen, let it go. Can we do that? As a sign that it's gone and it's far from us. So let's have a moment of silence using our hands in front of our mouths and just talk to God about what you think you need to say sorry to him for this week. So Jesus, we catch hold of those things that we know we've said and that we've done that we shouldn't have done. And Lord, also the things that we've thought and the things that we should have said that you've prompted us to say and we ignored. We capture them all and we give them to you, Jesus. And we say thank you so much for your grace, for your mercy, that we are the forgiven people. In Jesus, your holy name. Amen. So we have a visitor with us this morning, and um, she's going to be introduced in just a minute. Um, We are doing a slightly different service this morning. You may have already noticed. Um, If you haven't, never mind. Um, And if you missed the email, don't worry. It's going to be great. Um, But I want to tell you about two things before we move on with our services. And um, with our service, sorry, only one. Um, I was watching... um, Mike Pilavacci speak at Soul Survivor Watford, you know, online. I was catching up from last week, um, this morning, and he was saying, um, God is a God of miracles. We have the evidence. He was talking about us getting into the semi final. Well, now we've got the evidence because we're in the final. God really is a God of miracles. But actually, he's not just a God of miracles because of that. He's a God of miracles uh, because of the work he does in us and amongst us. And he makes the impossible possible. And it really struck me that Soul Survivor were saying, we can't restart our um, children's groups because we don't have enough leaders. And I thought, wow. You know, actually, that really helped me because that problem is universal. It's not just um, in smaller churches. It's universal, even in bigger churches. And uh, actually, we do have enough leaders, and we're, we're, we're already going, aren't we? We're doing well, so praise God for that. But in the summer months, we're going to have six Sundays when we do things a bit different. We're calling them Smart Summer Sundays. We're going to be um, all ages together, including our little tiny um, Hannah-aged, preschool-aged ones. Uh, we're going to be all ages together, and we're going to be having a lot of fun down in the upper hall. Now, you might think that you want to come to church and come in here. Well, let me tell you something. For those six weeks, the place to meet God is going to be down there in the upper hall. So if you want to meet with God down there, I can't, I don't know my left from my right, my north from my south, down there. (laughs) So if you want to meet with God during the summer holidays, don't come in here, volunteer to work with me and our team and uh, meet with God down in the upper hall, please, with the children. It's going to be fantastic. Also, over the summer, we're going to be um, doing quite a lot of stuff in Castle Park. It's a real heart of ours uh, that we think God has given us to just be a presence and reach out there in the park. So week in, week out, we're going to be making, being a presence in the park. And all sorts of people come through the park. It's not just children and teenagers. It's also anybody with a dog um, and anyone who needs to pass through the park to get to town. So we've got a massive field there, if you like, of mission of people in Liscard who come through that way. So um, do tell me if you want to be involved and sign up for that. So now I'm going to hand over to Steve and we're going to welcome our lovely visitor. Morning. Oh, gosh. Morning. I'll try to be a bit quieter. Uh, great great to speak to you. Great, great to be with you this morning. Um, Kelly here is our, um, our new archdeacon, but also responsible for um, children's work. Uh, tell me exactly what your title is, Kelly, because I'm not quite sure what it is. I am the director 
That's good, isn't it? Director yeah. of Intergenerational Church. So here we have Intergenerational Church Directors, please. Um, <laughs> You're doing a good job. Thank you. <laughs> Kelly's going to be speaking to us later, but I just wanted to welcome you. Great to have you here. Thank you very much. Partly why we're doing things a bit differently today, and partly we just want to involve everybody today in what's going on. And what you don't know yet is that um, the children are going to be learning how to, how to lead us in prayer. So they could be leading us in prayer later on during the service, so that'll be fantastic. But now, should we stand now? Because we're going to worship. Oh, Jesus, we thank you that we have the privilege of worshipping you. And we can stand before Almighty God. We can stand in your presence and worship you. Lord, we pray for your presence to be felt by all of us here today. Lord, let our, our praises ring out. We can't sing out loud, but we can sing with our hearts. Lord, we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to start with the song that definitely if people have been involved in the, the family gatherings that we've been, we've been doing over the last few months, you will definitely know this song. Uh, My Lighthouse. In fact, you probably know it very well. In which case, again, in the building you can't sing, but you can certainly move. You can even stomp your foot if you want. Give us a bit of percussion this morning. In my wrestling, in my doubts, in my failures, you won't walk out. Your great love will lead me through. You are the peace in my troubled sea. Oh, you are the peace in my troubled sea. In the silence, in the silence, you won't let go. In the questions, your truth will hold. Your great love will lead me through. You are the peace in my troubled sea. Oh, you are the peace in my troubled sea. Here we go, my lighthouse. My lighthouse, my lighthouse, shining in the darkness. I will follow you.
Save to show That song's that was song all about Jesus being our, our lighthouse, being our, our light, and the Bible even says he's the light of the world. But um, we're gonna we're gonna sing a song that's all about um, taking that light and having it live within us, okay? And it's all about us being able to shine Jesus' light through anything that we do. You know, we can do it in school, we can do it in work, we can do it with our families, we can do it walking down the road, we can do it playing with Pokemon cards anything this is called City on a Hill now actually I have to I don't know if I'm, I'm allowed to make demands probably not <laughs> Grace is giving me vision but on the, when it gets to the chorus it says let my light shine We've got to do this, guys. Uh, just purely because I want to see a room full of people doing this. Okay? This is you reminding yourself to let your light shine, okay? So when it gets to that bit, I want to see it. Okay, here we go. Here we go. I am a city. I am a city on a hill. I am a light in the darkness. Jesus living in me can change the world. I am a city on a hill. I am a light in the darkness. Jesus living in me can change the world. Are you ready? So let my light shine, let my light shine, let my light shine. Let it shine, let my light shine, let my light shine, let my light shine. Very good. God is for me, who can stand against me? Let my light shine, let my light shine, let my light shine. Very good. If God is for me, who can stand against me? Let my light shine, let my light shine, let my light shine. That was really good. This time we are a city on a hill. We are a city on a hill. We are a light in the darkness. Jesus living in us can change the world. We are a city on a hill. We are a light in the darkness. Jesus living in us can change the world. Are you ready? So let your light shine, let your light shine, let your light shine. Let it shine, let my light shine, let my light shine, let my light shine. If God is for me, who can stand against me? Let my light shine, let my light shine, let my light shine. If God, if God is for me, who can stand against me? Let my light shine, let my light shine, let my light shine. Shine, let my light shine, let my light shine. Okay, let's do we are a city on a hill. We are a city on a hill. We are a light in the darkness. Jesus living in us can change the world. And again, we are a city on a hill. We are a light in the darkness. Jesus living in us can change the world. So here we go. Let my light shine, let my light shine, let my light shine. Let it shine, let my light shine, let my light shine, let my light shine. If God is for me, who can stand against me? Let my light shine, let my light shine, let my light shine. Oh, if God is for me, who can stand against me? Let my light shine, let my light shine, let my light shine. Amen. Amen. What we're going to do now is anybody under the age of 18 is going to follow me, and we're going to go out down to the upper hall for a very short time to think about prayer, 
the preschoolers are still going to go to their normal room. Um, but anyone in primary school and secondary school, could you that follow Phil nice. and I? And we will be back in about 20, 25 minutes. Um, have fun. 25. Adults, while we're not here. <laughs> and we're taking the chocolates with us. <laughs> 25 would be great, I reckon. Ish. Well, so, um, Kelly, do you want to come and join us at the front if you can? Because uh, we've got a kind of double act this morning in two halves. If you, can you have a double act in two halves? Well, we're going to do that today, even if you can't. So, Kelly's going to start off and just introduce us to prayer, really. And then I've got a few things to talk about afterwards. So, well, over to you. Thank you. Actually, before we do that, I just need to say thank you to my wonderful wife, because my coffee seems to recharge itself. Thank you. <laughs> a miracle. A miracle. Just say their headsets and masks don't go together. It's good to be with you all. I will get my headset sorted out in a minute and uh, join you front and centre. This is just to build the uh, suspense. If you can't see the box, you might want to move a little bit closer. Not too close, social distancing and all that, but, you know, feel free to, to come where you can actually see this box. Um, last time I was here, I wasn't even in role. I'd, um, I came down, we moved down in April, and uh, I snuck into a service. And you were talking about prayer then, so I'm already really impressed with this church, because all you do is talk about prayer, which is phenomenal. Um, I'm always a little surprised that Jesus didn't say more about prayer than we seem to have in scripture, that he didn't teach about it more. Um, perhaps he did say more and we just haven't got it recorded in the gospels, I don't know. So it makes me very reticent to talk too much about prayer because I suspect that what we have in scripture is pretty much all we need and we probably just need to get on with it rather than talk about it too much. And I wonder whether Jesus didn't say very much about prayer in terms of teaching his disciples because he was with them all the time, wasn't he? So they were in that constant flow of conversation with him, and they got to see him in action, and they probably picked up far more about his life of prayer by watching than actually by him, him teaching. They saw his example of living in that constant flow of conversation with his heavenly father. Um, we're reminded, I think, in Scripture that sometimes when God speaks, it is overwhelming and dramatic and loud, and sometimes it's just a lot softer. It's not always showy and loud, is it? Sometimes God's voice is just very quiet. Maybe it can even seem absent sometimes. And maybe that reminds us that, that when we pray, it doesn't always have to be those who pray loudest and longest who are the ones that should be copied or admired. I can remember being a new Christian. Uh, I came to faith at the age of, of 16, and I can remember being in a house group then. And uh, we used to read scripture together, study scripture, and pray at the end of our house group. And I can remember in those early days of being new in the faith, that awful moment when you knew that the prayer was sort of creeping around the circle and it was going to get to you. Does it, can people identify with that? And I can remember sitting there thinking, oh no, I don't know what I'm going to pray. I don't know what I'm going to pray. And rehearsing things in my head whilst everyone else was praying, waiting for it to get to me. And of course, I didn't join in with anyone else's prayer really, because I was so worried about what I was going to be praying. I thought at the time that, that prayer was more of a performance than it was anything else. And I needed to understand that prayer is about a love that is shared rather than a performance where the words matter. So if you know that anxiety of sitting in a group thinking, I can't pray, I can't pray out loud, I can't pray, then let me encourage you because I think that was actually a really good experience for me to learn to pray in that setting. It felt like pressure at the time. But that's where I found my voice in prayer and where I learned that, that actually God just delights to hear our voices um, and, and God just wants to share love with us. And so we don't need to be afraid of hearing our own voices in prayer. That's fine. There's no great mystery to it. There's just great love. 
Now, my sense is that, that when we read about Jesus speaking about prayer in Matthew, that, um, that the disciples were keen to learn to pray because it seemed like they were missing out. They said to Jesus, come on, the other rabbis are teaching their disciples how to pray. So, you know, Jesus, get with the program. Teach us how to do it. And I wonder whether he'd avoided that up until that point because he didn't want it to seem like it was just about set pieces. Um, he wanted the disciples to grasp that it was more about relationship than it was saying the right words. And so he, he sort of seemed to suggest there wasn't a formula, this wasn't a tick box exercise. And he warned them not to make prayer into a show, but to seek something that was more intimate and softly spoken. Prayer as a whisper. And the whisper that Jesus taught the disciples went something like this. Our Father in heaven. Our Father in heaven, Abba, God's love for us is so great that it's as though we're held in the palm of God's hand. Our Father in heaven, Abba. It's as though we use a term of intimacy with God. God cares for us so much that we can come close and use a name that speaks of closeness and intimacy. Like a small child might call their father, Daddy, or their mother, Mummy. God loves us so much that it's as though we're held in the palm of God's hand. Our Father in heaven, Abba, hallowed be your name. Remember when we pray that our Heavenly Father is holy, very holy. God is all that is good, all that is light. And so we say, holy is your name. Our Father in heaven, Abba, your name is holy. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. get a prize if you can win, if you can find uh, Cornwall on that globe. Extra prizes if you can pinpoint this God. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. God loves us so much that God has spread his love over the whole world, every corner of the world, north, south, east, west. There's no part of the world that God doesn't care for, and there is no part of the world that God does not want us to care for as well. Our Father in heaven, Abba, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. hope you've had breakfast. You're probably thinking about lunch already, aren't you? I can only offer you a bread roll. There might be some celebrations, chocolates, but I think they've gone with the children, so I doubt it very much. Give us this day our daily bread. God loves us so much that God wants us to have all the things we need, not necessarily all the things we want. We might want to bear that in mind later depending on how the football goes. 
but all the good things that we need. And God would give us those things anyway, whether we asked or not, but God loves us to ask because we're in relation with our Heavenly Father. God loves us to share our lives with him. And our daily bread is not just the toast that we had for breakfast. It's not the burger buns that we eat. It's not the honey sandwiches that we're going to have for tea later. It's everything that we need, our friends, our family, our homes, the clothes that keep us warm, the love and the food to nourish us. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins. as we forgive those who sin against us. Someone said earlier they thought that I had put a tomato down. It, it's actually a heart. It's not a tomato. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. This part of the prayer is about God's love for us. And God knows that we don't always get things right. And God has given us 10 ways to help us to live and also to remind us that we can know when we have got things wrong. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. God wants us to know that not only are we loved, but that we have a responsibility to love others as we are loved, to forgive those who sin against us. This part of the prayer is about what we can do for other people. Lead us not into temptation. It's a very heavy rock. You could stumble over it. You could certainly stub your toe on it. Sometimes the things that trip us up can be very, very heavy. Lead us not into temptation. Sometimes it seems as though our stumbling blocks are all too obvious. Sometimes we just seem to find them out, don't we? The things that can trip us up. Lead us not into temptation. Sometimes we don't need to be led there. We can find our own way quite easily. Deliver us from evil. Throughout scripture, God makes promises that even when things seem to go wrong, we're never left by ourselves. The rainbow was one of those sorts of signs, wasn't it? God said, you're not going to be left alone in this. I'm going to be with you. And we have that reminder in the cross as well. There's nothing that we can stumble over or do wrong that God is not able to take care of. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. That's the part of the prayer that we have in our Bibles. But today, the end of the prayer is full of praise. It's full of joy because of God's eternal love. Yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. Yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory. From the beginning of time, with us now and forevermore. Amen. As you hear those words and you look at the images in front of you, I wonder what you like best about this prayer. I wonder... What part of the prayer you think is most important? I wonder where you are in this prayer at the moment. I wonder which part of the prayer you need most today. I wonder if there is anything in this prayer that we could leave out 
and still have all the prayer that we need. And I wonder if we stay silent long enough today, whether we will hear God's whisper in response. Thank you, Kelly, for just bringing home some, oh, I've said that prayer so many times, and some, some ideas about how, how I can think of it newly. And I want to move on from that to, to ask you a question. What would your life be like? What would your life be like if you knew the meaning of life? <clears throat> if you knew what really mattered if you knew what your purpose was, that I think nothing would ever stress you out, would it? You wouldn't worry about all the little stuff if you could just see what was important in your life. And that's what so many of us crave, isn't it? An understanding of what's really important. And I think that's what we're looking for when we seek God through prayer. And that's why we pray. We pray to seek God, we seek his will, and we want to get to know him. And from this simple act of prayer flows courage, perseverance, and strength. And do you know what it really does? Imagine what it would be like for you if you could see everything through the eyes of God. If you saw everything through God's eyes, you could do anything. Our church could do anything. We could go to the streets, pray for people, heal people, bring hope, compassion, bring justice. And just some encouragement. We were out on the streets praying last Friday, and two people came and joined us in church because of it. And what the, this morning this was. What a great kind of witness to prayer, really. Like we could be part, couldn't we, of bringing the kingdom of God to Lisgard in our area. If we walk with God, he walks with us through the power of the Spirit, and he will work through us. And the disciples have been with Jesus for years and years and years, and all of a sudden, they turn to him and say, teach us to pray. And what a strange question, because they don't ask, how do you plant churches, how do we grow this, how do we preach? They wanted to know how to pray, because they wanted to listen to God. Because you see, God, as many of you will know, sometimes seems very, very quiet, silent. We pray, and often the answer we get is silence. It's a wonderful story, sad story of a, a woman who said when she grew up, she held her mother's hand um, walking through the streets. And then later on, 70 years later, as her mother was dying, she held her mother's hand in reverse. It was a terrible time, but, and she felt at that moment that God was silent. She prayed, where was God in that time? And we've all had this, haven't we? This still small, still small voice of calm or the still small voice of silence. Silence can be deafening, can't it? But God is active and God is alive today, just as he was in biblical times. But he's not a kind of holy magician who does whatever we want, whenever we want. He created a world and he keeps it going in all its amazing complexity. And he created us to be part of it as his highest, the fulfillment of all creation. And he gave us the freedom to be ourselves. And if you think about it, it's the most precious thing we have, our freedom. The freedom to think and be who we want. And our choices, our autonomy, it's so important to us, especially these days. It's where our culture is. And I read a few days ago about them, an Australian childcare group called the Only About Children group. And they advise parents... Listen, if you've got a small child here, it says you must ask your permission, I'm sorry, ask the permission of your child or your baby before you change its nappy. How on earth do you do that? <laughs> and uh, it provoked quite a lot of response, as you can imagine. And uh, one mother's response on Twitter was that um, when it came to nappy changing, there was, I quote, no time for talk of any kind apart from that stinks. It is a bit of a nut story, isn't it? But it speaks to where so many of us are today, so many people are. The most important thing is self-autonomy, respect, and self. All God's actions are actually based around preserving our freedom to be ourselves. The freedom to be ourselves until we choose God. He chooses us, but we have to choose him in return. God tells Moses that no one can see his face and live. But you see, God reveals just enough of himself to let us know that he loves us, but not so much that we're overwhelmed by him and cease to be able to be ourselves. And that amount's different from each of you. <clears throat> so if some person sees them more of God than you, that's because that's appropriate to them. And it's just like a child, like a parent rather, who carefully lets their child bake a cake, draw a picture, play the piano, 
You have to let them make mistakes, don't you, so they can learn for themselves. Then you clear the mess up. That's what God does. You see, God acts in the world in a predictable way that, that allows us to know what's going on, to have freedom not to be overwhelmed. But you see, the world has got to make rules. There's got to be rules in the world. How many of us have cried out, God, why have you let this happen? Why do earthquakes and illnesses happen? How many of us have cried out? Well, it's because if the world didn't follow rules, we wouldn't know where we were. There's good and there's bad about it. But God doesn't just wind the clock up and let it run, you know. There are times when he does intervene. He's there and he's in control and he does act when he decides and when we can cope. So I want to turn to scripture now and uh, and have a look at the book of Esther because it's one of my favorite books of the Bible. And and it's really struck, people often ask, why is Esther in the Bible? Because God's completely silent in the Bible. Sorry, not in the Bible, in Esther. Freud didn't slip that one. Um, There's no prayers in Esther, no mention of scripture. But you see, in this book, God's not silent. He just doesn't speak. Let me tell you what's going on. So if you don't know the book, I'm just going to give you a really quick rundown of what happens. It's a brilliant story. It's got threats and betrayal, sexual exploitation, tragedy, two beautiful and brave princesses, queens, handsome heroes, and loads of brilliant baddies. It's just the best. How can you get a book that's better than that? And we meet one of these baddies right at the very beginning of of the book, and he's called Xerxes. And he gives this massive feast for all these noblemen and these princes and commanders. And for seven days, they drink and drink and drink, and they're absolutely hammered, completely drunk. And then Xerxes had a brilliant idea. He said, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm going to get my wife to stand in front of all of them so they can ogle at her. She doesn't want to do this. She is not up for this at all. And so she refuses. And Xerxes is furious, and he deposes her. And so the search begins for someone to replace her. And you want to search throughout the entire land for the most beautiful woman to become the new queen. What a brilliant premise for a film, eh? I've never seen a film about Esther. I don't understand why. Um, But the scene jumps then, you see, to a different place. And we meet the hero of the story, Mordecai. He's got an adopted daughter who just happens to be the most beautiful girl in the world, called Esther. And they're both Jewish. And the king's men come for Esther because they've heard about her. And Mordecai tells her, whatever you do, do not tell them your identity, that you're Jewish. So anyway, the the book carries on. The king falls in love with Esther. She becomes queen. And soon after this, Mordecai happens to be standing by the city gate when he overhears some soldiers plotting to get rid of the king. So Mordecai tells Esther. She tells the king. The plotters are impaled on sticks. Mordecai gets the credit. And so far, so good. Brilliant film. But you know, don't you, when things are going well in a film, it's going to get bad. But before we get there, just let me tell you why I love this part of the story, because it reminds me of Jesus. You see, Jesus told the demons not to reveal his identity, and Esther keeps her identity secret from the demons of her day. Esther's father is not her real father, neither is Joseph, Jesus' father, God's his father. And Mordecai hears the, the plot by the city gate. And this is a kind of biblical thing, this, that um, the court, the law courts always took place by the city gate. So whenever you get anybody referring to the city gate, it's always talking about justice. Mordecai, an honest man, hears of evil by the gates of justice. And then this honest man comes to the attention of the king. So far, so good, but it gets nastier from now on. Mordecai is now a threat to the authorities. A good man is a threat to the authorities. John eleven forty five. 45, if we let this man Jesus go on like this, everyone will believe in him and the Romans will come and take away both our temple and our nation. Then the high priest, then Caiaphas, high priest spoke up, you know nothing. You don't realize it's better that one man should die for the people than the whole nation perish. Even in Esther, all those years ago, we're pointing towards Jesus. But then along comes the baddie. So the big question is, who is the best baddie in the world? Who is it? For me, Darth Vader. Anybody beat Darth Vader? Yeah, there's some nods around. We'll go with Darth Vader. Darth Vader of the ancient world was called Haman. And he was a proper baddie. And he was a favorite of this king, King Xerxes. And everybody had to kneel before him, but Mordecai refused to do this. And this man, Haman, was furious. And he vowed not only to kill Mordecai, but the entire Jewish race. And only one woman can save them. Only one woman has the, one woman has the ear of the king. Esther, but she by now has a problem. 
<laughs> because Xerxes, being a baddie himself, has moved on. He's got fed up with Esther. And somebody else is now where she used to be. But she had to talk to the king. But the penalty for approaching the king without a summons was instant death. So what was Esther to do? It's ironic. And Esther's in a dilemma. Speak out. Remain silent. I think that sometimes God longs to speak out and save us from ourselves. But out of love for us, he keeps quiet. The paradox of love and when to speak. Gosh, we've been there before ourselves, haven't we? And here's our heroine, the only one who can save the Jews, silenced by the law. So what does she do? She organizes two parties, massive banquets. She charms the king, gets him in bed, and then she reminds him that Mordecai once saved him from assassination. He must be rewarded, says the king. So he calls in Haman to give him a robe and a horse to Mordecai. Haman's furious because he wants the stuff for himself. He builds a huge stake to impale Mordecai on. They, sort of, they seem to like impaling people on stakes. But the king discovers a plot, and Haman gets impaled himself. And result, the goodies win. That's the story of Esther, basically. But the best bit about Esther, and I think the bit that we need to learn for our church, is this. At the end of the book, the Feast of Purim is established. And Purim's a Jewish festival. And the tradition is that you get absolutely paralytically drunk during Purim. Then you discuss theology. So we're going to start that in February. <laughs> a brilliant story of the great ending. But where's God in all this lot? A great, where, where's God? Where is God? He seems totally absent. No word from him at all. No prophecy, no scripture, nothing. Total silence. Or is it just that he doesn't speak? Can you imagine what's been, how many Jews were on their knees praying, Lord, save us from Haman? And he did. I think Esther's like a good film, you need, or a good football team with Gareth Southgate. You need someone to direct it. You've got plots and twists and action and passion, but every film needs a director. And that's what this book teaches us. God's the director, quietly and efficiently running everything. Lining up the story, organizing the script, organizing the props so you have a lustful king a beautiful girl an honest father and it all leads to the salvation of the jews now, if you've been in esther's shoes you'd never have seen that coming would you you have to understand god's timing too the way he sees things and in hindsight we can see it all a girl who loses her father is confined in a harem and forced into a vile marriage yet all this leads as mordecai says to a time when she alone can save her people you see, God was there all along, providing for her, teaching her, building in her a deep and faithful heart that f allowed her finally to risk her life for her people. That's what she did. God was absent in voice, but he was there the whole time. So as we move towards a close now, let me ask you this question. If you were a plant that was deprived of water, you'd grow deeper and deeper roots, wouldn't you? Until you found the life-giving water, the water of life. If you've ever had times in your life or relationship when everything seemed to be falling apart, if you're clinging on with your fingernails, then you'll know that it was that deep, deep importance of a relationship that kept you going. And that, my friends, is prayer. Maybe when God is silent, we need to recognize that perhaps we just need, maybe we just stopped listening a long time ago. And the silence is a mercy from God which tells us that through our sufferings, our relationship with him is so vital that it's worth hanging on to by our breaking fingernails and growing new roots. C.S. Lewis said this, God whispers to us in our pleasures, but shouts to us in our sufferings. Suffering is God's megaphone to rouse a deaf world. And the Bible is full of pictures of suffering in the face of God's silence. And in the book of Job, he suffers terribly, God's silent. John the Baptist doubts in prison. God is silent. The psalmist cries in anguish, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And Jesus cries in agony. The same thing on the day before he dies. Um, that, that's not the end of the story. But you see, God then speaks to Job in deafening thunder. John sends his servants to Jesus to ask if he's the Messiah, and Jesus reassures him. And the psalmist turns from anguish and praises God. And Jesus, well, Jesus lived through the silence of God and saved the world. He died with our sins on his back and rose again to save the world. For God's silence is never the end of the story. It might be the difficult part, the part with twists and turns and betrayals and frustrations. But redemption comes. The story ends as a great director wanted it to end. 
and we can rest in the knowledge that God is in charge. So then, this is the conclusion. If we're going to get through all of that lot, if we're going to have the courage and perseverance to succeed and keep on going, no matter what life throws at us, we're going to need some courage and we're going to need some confidence. And that is prayer. That is what the disciples wanted to know how, that's why they wanted to know how to pray. So they could get to know God and learn to see the world through God's eyes as they live through their difficult times. Lord, teach us to pray. Teach us to pray. Amen. So now we're going to have our time of prayer and we're going to um, do it a little bit differently this morning. Noah, could I borrow your the thing in your hand? This is Noah's. We were looking at the um, Sunday School Lesson 101 this morning um, about prayer and how a teaspoon in a recipe book is spelled tsp and tsp means thank you, sorry, and please. And when Jesus taught us how to pray with the um, Lord's Prayer, that's the format that he taught us, isn't it? Thank you, sorry, please. And I was saying how I remember so clearly the first time I was taught this, um, there's Zephaniah's, by my grandmother, because she was my Sunday school leader. (laughs) And I still, to this day, remember it. But we were also talking about how prayer is a conversation, And um, Jesus said, when you pray, go into a room on your own and shut the door. And we talked about how actually prayer is a private thing and it's something that is a conversation between God and us. And so often when we pray, we do do this thank you, sorry, please business, don't we? Even in church, we do that. But often our prayer is one-sided and it's us talking. And that's what we were discovering Um, this morning and we did something that's really hard and we're about to do it with you as well now thank you Noah so the children um, are going to set an example I hope Uh, in Timothy Paul says to Timothy don't let um, anyone look down on you because you are young but set an example to the believers and that's what we're going to do this morning I hope is set an example to the believers hey children my own children aren't even listening Um, So what we're going to do is have a time of silence, of listening to God. And then we're going to share what God has said. And the sharing of what God has said is open to everybody. Um, The children have been practicing down in the hall. And um, I welcome anybody and everybody to share what God has said. And we were saying how God speaks in different ways. You may hear a voice, although actually that's probably the least likely You may get a thought that flutters across your mind like a butterfly. You may see a picture or be reminded of something or get a feeling. But in that time of silence when we're asking God to speak, any of those things can be God speaking. And so we then need to share it with one another to build each other up. Because you never know. You might just get the randomest thought of potato. You might just think potato. And you think, well, that can't be God speaking. But actually it can be. And you might say potato. And somebody else in the congregation is thinking, wow, how did they know that? How did they know that? God can speak. So let's make some space for that. So we're going to have a time of silence. With the children, what we did is we put our hands over our mouths to help us to not talk. And um, we closed our eyes to help us to concentrate. So that's what we're going to do. Jesus, we welcome you. We want to hear your voice. Father God, we long to be in your presence and hearing what you want to say to the body of believers. So we just give you this time. Would you speak to us?
Amen. And now we're going to share what God has said. And a bit like when we're doing the thank yous earlier, if you want to put your hand up, be brave, be courageous. And if you, even if you're not sure it's God, speak and uh, God will use you. He thanked me for listening to everything that he, uh, everything that I that he said in the lower in the upper hall, and and thank you for worshiping him and coming to church. Amen. Thank you. Okay, brilliant. Yeah. God is thanking me for being a kind friend and caring. Brilliant, brilliant. Thank you, Amen. Just that God says He loves us because He loves us because He loves us. Amen. Thank goodness He loves us because He loves us because He loves us. Um, I got a picture almost immediately of an icon uh, style painting of uh, Mary, not carrying Jesus, but just in a, with a hand of blessing, as though it was over all your youth work. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, man. Mm. Wave at me if I'm not noticing you. Yeah. Okay. Oh, man. Now, it's a bit scary, isn't it? <laughs> I tell you what, I was super scared at the front here. <laughs> it takes a lot of courage. But actually, God wants to speak to us, and he wants us to use, he wants to use us to speak to each other. And we were talking, actually, what if God didn't speak to you in that time? Is that okay? That was part of what we talked about in our group Um and actually, yeah, that is okay. It's really okay if in that time of silence you didn't hear anything because God uses each one of us to help the other. And so um, don't think, oh, God doesn't want to talk to me. Of course he does. The other thing we talked about was practice. Actually, tuning in. I don't know, probably the children and the young people won't remember, but I certainly do remember because I'm old enough, um, radios that were really hard to tune and actually, even in Tanzania, trying to get the world service was almost impossible, trying to tune that in. <laughs> so, you know, it's like that. We have to tune into God. So I just want to encourage you to practice it at home. When we have our prayer times, let's not always be the babbling, asking for prayer. But let's sometimes just stop and have stillness and silence. And I really hope that um, you also felt the presence of God in that time when we were silent. God was really present. Um, he's always present, but sometimes he just reveals his presence a bit more, and that was really exciting. So we haven't done our normal prayers, and forgive me, particularly if you're at home and you were hoping to follow along with um, some prayers, we're going to say together the Lord's Prayer now to finish up, um, but all those things that we normally pray for, our leaders and people who are unwell, we still want to pray for them, and we can still do that in our hearts and in our homes um, later on in the day. But let's just join together to say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Amen. We're going to have our final song uh, before our blessing. Great. 
let's uh, we're going to sing 10,000 reasons together <laughs> Isn't it amazing that God speaks in different ways to different people? I always think that's an incredible thing. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh. Soul, I worship your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning. It's time to sing a song again. Whatever may pass on, whatever lies before me let me be singing when the evening comes bless the Lord bless the Lord oh my soul oh my soul worship his holy name sing like this Rich in love, you're rich in love, and you're so to anger. Your name is great, and your heart is kind. For all your goodness, I will keep on singing. Ten thousand reasons for my heart to find. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. Bless the Lord, bless the Lord, oh my soul. Oh, all my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I worship Your holy name. And on that day. time has come, still my soul will sing your praise unending, ten thousand years and then forevermore, bless the Lord, oh bless the Lord, oh my soul.
I'm not accustomed to doing this, but um, it's really struck me as the children have come back in and Kelly's um, expression of the Lord's Prayer has been set out here, how they've come in and taken what they've needed. Um, and Elijah and Hannah have tucked into the bread roll and um, Zeph and Will have picked up the globe and, and touched and felt and taken part in this prayer. Um, and it really struck me God didn't say anything to me when I was being quiet and trying to listen to him, but I really feel like he says, look, I lay it all out for you. Take what you need. Come and take part. Pull it around and, and be part of that prayer um, as my children. I seem to have found myself in a position of doing the blessing, which is lovely. <laughs> So, let's keep a moment of quiet and just acknowledge what God has been doing among us this morning and all that God wants to do. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May God look kindly on you and give you his peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. And I don't know whether you do it here, but go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.